Okay. Oh, my goodness. We're going to talk about a lot of things over China today, but um, but first, we're going to talk about China itself with Carl Baker, Senior Advisor of Pacific Forum here on Global Connections. So let's start with China as China, inside China, and COVID. We should, we should understand what's going on there because it's not a small thing. What's going on there, Carl? I mean, they are basically, every time they have an outbreak, they're shutting down the city, locking, locking people down, corralling them in their apartments. Uh, so, I mean, you know, ultimately you, you can do anything in China. You can die from anything in China except COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, to put it, to put it bluntly, you know, they, they've, they've become so obsessed with, with the policy that they've kind of lost track of, of the larger context of, of people are dying for, for, for lack of, lack of uh, medical care because everybody's locked up over COVID. You know, and, 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 it's a, and it's sort of a, a, a overblown case of what we had here in the United States where people were putting off medical care you know, for fear of catching COVID and there was the lack of capacity at the hospitals. There, it, it's, it's just a lack of capacity for caring about anything other than controlling uh, COVID. This is, this is really disturbing in the sense that it reflects either a, uh, what do you want to call it, a government culture point. Uh, you know, we'll pick the agenda and you better follow or else and nothing else matters. Or B, um, Xi Jinping has a specific, you know, uh, intention in mind. Uh, and some people have suggested that this is one way he enhances his power um, by just showing you just how strong he is. Is it one or both or neither of those two possibilities? What do you think? It, it's, it's both. I mean, I, I don't want to give Xi Jinping all the credit because I think he operates in a, you know, in a political system that requires him to, to gather some support for what he's doing. But certainly, you know, it's the weakness of a centrally planned government where, where you become obsessed with a, with a particular goal and you lose sight of the larger social contract that you have with the people of the of the country, and I think this is this is a glaring example of of what happens when when people lose sight of what what their real responsibility of, of the government is. That's a really uh, you know that's a revelation of sorts because up to this point, just thinking me, I'm I'm an, uh, I'm a novice about this. Um, you know, I thought that the Chinese government had the the followership. They had the control, um, and they knew what to do uh, for COVID. But now it, it's, it's, you wonder if their decision process in general is flawed. Their perception of the public opinion is flawed. Their, their, their relationship with the public, with the Chinese people, 1.4 or 5 billion of them, it could be flawed. What, what, they don't have to do this is the point, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it reflects a lack of adaptability, you know, for one thing. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's really the, one of the one of the key elements here. And, and again, it's a it's a key element in any centrally planned organization or, or, or government, if you will, in this case, that if you don't if you don't maintain connectivity to the people, then you lose sight of, of what really is happening. And I think, you know, it's a classic case. If you look at, at what's happening now in, in China and Taiwan, it's really kind of interesting because what's, what you see in the Taiwan papers today and, and over the last couple of weeks is we're not going to do this what China's doing. We're, we're going to recognize that we need to make some adaptations and we, need, we can't just maintain the zero COVID policy. You know, so they're in the position now where they have a lot of cases of, of homegrown cases, which, you know, in the past, Taiwan was doing fairly draconian measures in their own right. But now they've recognized, you know, that, that people are complaining, people are concerned, people are worried. And, and so they've made the adaptation. China isn't making the adaptation, just like in, in Hong Kong happened. You know, Hong Kong is, is the other example, which, of course, went through that same lockdown. So you can see how, how the different systems play out when, when you are confronted with something that requires adaptation. Well, autocracy, and I would have to say that, you know, I consider China an autocracy, um, leads to brutality. And what they're doing here is, is brutal. Mm -hmm. um, it, and uh, worse than that, it's, it's brutal in terms of dealing with their own citizens. It is, it is applying the same kind of brutality you see in Xinjiang against the Uyghurs, against the, 
against all the people in China or the people in Shanghai and Beijing. Um, but it is you no know, also they have lost they have lost their mojo with many millions of people who are are kicked off at them and in public making public statements against the government. We are in a different a different time, don't you think? I wouldn't. I, I, I would be careful in, in going too far because they've also been very careful to control that narrative inside China. You know, I mean, again, you know, we we from the outside looking in want to want to blow this bigger than it might be, and and so I would I would be careful how how they actually play this out. You know, if they do start responding to to some of the uh, criticism that they're getting from inside China, because you do see some of it, you know, it'll show up on Weibo for a little while and then it'll disappear. And, you know, and so there's, there's, they, they've got to be seeing what's happening. And, and so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because they, they are going to have to move off zero COVID. Uh, it's just a question of how they do it and how fast they do it, I think. <clears throat> well, um, why, and this is a hard one, and I, I don't know if you or I would know, why, why did they have this surge anyway? I mean, they've had, I mean, it may not be extraordinary number of cases, but it's more than ever before in terms of day, day by day uh, infections. What happened? I thought they had a handle on this. Well, I, I mean, I think there's a combination of things is, is one, there is still traffic in and out of China. And, and two, the, you know, the vaccines that the, the Chinese made vaccines apparently are not as, as effective as, as some of the mRNA ones are that uh, they've refused to, to let in. So, you know, they don't have, they don't have access to the mRNA uh, vaccines. And so I think that's part of it. But then also, you know, you just simply can't control, especially when it comes to Omicron, the Omicron variants that, that uh, you know, that, that they're going to get in, you know, no matter, no matter what kind of a wall you build, no matter what kind of a tight seal you try to put around these cities. Is this a harbinger of what could happen in the United States? Well, no, I don't think so because I mean, first, uh, you know, the United States is is much more vac is 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 vaccinated with the mRNA, and you know, and we've let this sort of natural uh, this natural immunity build by having a lot of cases, you know. So that's you know, it's kind of the combination of of people have had COVID, and so they're not as vulnerable anymore, and then and then the mRNA is is a more effective vaccine. So I I I don't think so. I think I think that. That the United States, not just the United States, but also you know Europe and and the rest of Asia, are are coming to this realization that that you have to learn how to live with COVID, you know, and so that's why I, I think you see you know uh, people like Dr. Fauci saying you know it's it's time that we move on, we're past the pandemic phase, and and we're now into you know into the, into the endemic phase. You know, one one thing in China um, culturally is the metric. For a successful government is is the economy, how well people are doing, uh, how their lifestyle, you know, whether they have you know sufficient money and resources and consumer consumer goods available and so forth, all of that. But there have been reports, even from China. I don't know how accurate or or maybe they're you know crossing the line in, in terms of dealing with the, the propaganda machine um, that say. Uh, that the economy is being affected. Plants have been shut down. Important economic resources have been tied up because of the draconian steps on COVID. Uh, that, that could have a long-term effect, no? It could, it could be affecting what shows up in your port, too. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just it. It's, it's not just affecting the Chinese economy. It's, yeah. it's affecting the world economy. I mean, they're, yeah. now they're talking... You know that that we're we're taking you know percentage points out of out of GDP because because the, there's a bottleneck created in China over over consumer goods that aren't leaving the port aren't leaving Shanghai port aren't leaving Hong Kong ports you know and and so it not only affects China certainly it does but it also is affecting the rest of the uh, global economy. Will this affect uh, Xi Jinping's power? Will it call for reform? Uh, is there enough, you know, displeasure out there, whether it's articulated in the media or not, uh, that will change China? It, it could. I mean, I, I, it's it's hard it's hard to predict at this point. I think. Uh, I mean, certainly these kinds of things demonstrate that his his grasp on power 
isn't isn't as great as some people would like to believe it is. You know that he's not really really all that secure in in getting this position uh, of president for life or whatever ruler for life, whatever you want to call that position. It's really you shouldn't call it president. It's really not a a presidential position. It's really a a chairman of everything a position. And I, I you know I think that. Uh, it, it certainly challenges his ability to to impose his will uh, to the extent that that just COVID would do that. I, I I don't know, you know. But certainly the economic downturn, certainly the the, the dissatisfaction with with the way they've been handling uh, uh, the ability to travel, the ability to move between cities, is certainly going to create a lot of a lot of uh, displeasure. With how the government is running things, you know, so much of China it seems to me these days is base. They want to look strong and look like they're in control. Mm -hmm. um, they want to, you know, project that as a an element of power, or maybe a big element of power around the world, and uh, and it does give them advantages in their projects in various continents. Um, is this gaff, or I shouldn't say gaff? That's too strong a word. Is this problem um, affecting their 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 face, their projection of power? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it it just like it affects his 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 Xi Jinping's power in in China. It affects China because people are people from the outside are reporting this. People are 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 reporting, you know, the 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 sort of draconian measures. They they can't control the media outside of China as well as they can inside. So some of that some of that is out, and and of course people in the rest of the world can can see it. So yeah, so it hurts it hurts their credibility, and and it reminds people just like just like we just discussed reminds people that that there are weaknesses in in centrally controlled uh, governments, and and this is this is one of the big ones is. Is you 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 don't have a voice telling you you're headed in the wrong direction. Mm. So that's a natural segue. Is um, you know the interaction of whatever is going on there, whatever effect it has among the people, and um, you know uh, in in the image of China, the image of Xi Jinping um, on the question of Ukraine. Uh, it's almost like uh, you know the. The news from China is not as important as the news from Ukraine. That China is somehow a secondary priority on the world interest in current events. Uh, and the fact that uh, Xi Jinping has been um, you know, unsupportive of the coalition, somehow it affects that. I think a lot of people, I'm just suggesting to you, a lot of people, a lot of thought leaders in the world are saying, well, they're doing their thing. Uh, they don't want to, you know, they, they don't want to support um, uh, the coalition they want to they want to make a mess with Putin so they they they're going to they're going to support Putin but in a very mild mannered way and they marginalize themselves in the global conversation haven't they um well i think we need to be careful by by overstating that um i you know i mean china has been very good at not supporting and supporting both sides <laughs> you know they they've been really really noncommittal and uh, but they're not the only ones you know i mean fareed zakaria had a had a good piece i think it was last week you know where where he pointed out you know that it's not just china it's it's india it's indonesia those are big democracies and and, and then he goes on of course uh, mexico uh, brazil argentina nigeria you know, all these countries have been pretty noncommittal, and and even for that matter, the rest of Southeast Asia, absent uh, Singapore, have been pretty noncommittal about what's what's happening in Ukraine. So he's 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 playing. I think China is trying to play a, a very careful game here, where they don't they don't support Russia, but they don't not support Russia. Uh, you know, so so you've seen on the margins. You know, you've seen like the drone company. You know, quit selling drones to both Russia and Ukraine. You've seen, uh, you know, the cancellation of an oil project with with Russia. Uh, but also, I think China sees this as an opportunity to basically make China much more dependent, or to make Russia much more dependent on China. And so they don't really want to alienate Russia either. So, so they're playing a very, I think, a very trying to play a very careful game of of showing. 
just not showing, I, I mean, I have to say it in the negative, non-supporting both sides <laughs> is ultimately, other than blaming, other than blaming, you know, the United States and Europe for, for NATO expansion as, as the real cause, you know, that, but beyond that, there's been really no, no uh, su support or non-support beyond that. There's a risk in, uh, in, in playing, playing on the fence that way, isn't there? Um, can, I mean, for example, and I, you know, who knows how this is going to wind up. Um, suppose the Ukrainians um, win. Suppose they win. How does China come out of that? Or alternatively, suppose they lose and it's a, you know, a horrendous debacle and disaster uh, for Western Europe. How do they come out of that? Um, what, what are the risks for China either way? Well, see, I think I think the downside risk is is trying to lean too far one way or the other in their case. And, uh, you know, I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, sitting the fence has been a fairly effective strategy for for Southeast Asia for a long time. <laughs> you know, I mean, this this is this is sort of something that that Asian governments like to do is not make commitments to to one side or the other. So they want they want both sides. They want to be able to take advantage of the economic relationship. And yet, yet maintain the security relationship with the United States. And I think, you know, in in some respects, I think China sees this as 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 the real opportunity. Clearly, they've learned lessons about what what it means to go against the United States and Europe when they work together to to impose sanctions. And I'm sure that uh, China has rethought its its uh, reserves and in, in how it holds US bonds. I'm sure it's it's working hard to try to create an alternative to the SWIFT uh, system of moving money around. You know, they, they have the, the SIPs, the China Interbank uh, uh, Processing uh, System. You know, I'm sure that they're working hard to, to create that create that system as, as more, to make that system more robust so that people can use that as opposed to the, the Western controlled uh, institutions. You know, and, and so I think I think that's that's how China sees it, that they're playing they're playing this this middle game to take advantage of whichever side ends up winning, that they that they haven't alienated either one. And and so I think that that's that's how they, they view it. And I think that's probably an accurate assessment, because if 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 Russia wins, they can say, hey, we we were there for you, Russia, we continued to buy. Your your goods, you know. The, uh, there's there's some talk that uh, you know the Union Pay credit card has replaced Visa and Mastercard, you know. And then and, uh, and there's there's obviously a lot of uh, a lot of exchange going between uh, Russia and China with with oil and and gas. And so you know, so I think they're playing that side. And yet, if 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 Ukraine somehow wins, and I'm not sure what a Ukraine win looks like at this point beyond you know retaking retaking the Donbas. Uh, you know, I think that then they can come back and say, well, we never really supported China. We didn't give them any any military assistance, or we didn't we didn't really facilitate uh, any any uh, procurement uh, of, of military equipment. So we're still your friend, Ukraine. You know, and they've and they've made overtures to both Europe and to specifically to Ukraine, saying you know that that they call for for peaceful settlement and uh, and all that. So I, I think that they see, and I think they're correct at this point that they can they can take advantage of either way. You know, you, you mentioned uh, doing their own SWIFT system and all that, and it, it raises, um, you know, a very clever thing that Putin did to insist on payment in rubles for oil, mm -hmm. uh, avoid the U.S. dollar. I mean, is the U.S. dollar under pressure here? Um, is, uh, is one of the benefits that China could achieve is, is to change the reserve currency, maybe even present uh, the RMB as, as reserve currency, you know, I've, 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 I'm, I mean, I'm not smart enough to know the the yes or no answer to that, but I've certainly seen enough uh, enough uh, argument in in the media to support the idea that that China is going to try to take advantage of this of of, of facilitating uh, or ra increasing the speed of of the the globalization of the of the UN. You know, so I think that that's probably something that they're not they're not resisting. I don't know if they're actively doing it, but they're certainly not not resisting people who want to who want to increase uh, you know the trade trade in yuan and and whether they're whether they're uh, supporting the ruble. I mean, I would I would guess that they probably are 
you know, paying for their gas uh, in, in rubles. Uh, you know, I mean, look, if you look at what happened, you know, to the ruble, you know, it, it, it went way crazy up, you know, up, up, what, 140 or something. And now it's back down to where it was pre-war. It's back down around 90 again. So, so you know, so it looks clearly somebody supported that currency to get it to come back down. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that that because because China and and India for that matter and uh, you know uh, and other other places in the world in Africa continue to to support purchases in in ruble that uh, that in fact uh, you know they, they they again it but it's it's not an obvious support it's it's sort of a passive uh, accommodation you know I think that's that's the, the the way that that the Chinese see it and what they're trying to do is they're trying to be accommodative. To, to the Russian situation, and and you know they, they and then they go back and argue that that's consistent with their with their policy of non-interference, you know, and that's why that's why they continue to talk about the the conflict in Ukraine, you know, as the, the special military operation. They sort of take that that piece of Russian propaganda and and use it for their own for their own benefit because that way they don't have to choose sides and they can they can stay at something other than uh, outright aggression. It's clever. It's, you know, you got to say it's clever. <laughs> well, I, I mean, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, it's clever, but it's also, you know, should be rather, rather unsettling because you, you can see that that they're they're really playing playing the longer game here of of uh, trying to trying to hedge their their bets on both sides. Hmm. I'd like to talk for a minute about um, you know the Security Council in the United Nations. You know, one of the things that, that seemed to emerge early on here is that, of course, uh, Russia, as a member of the Security Council, would, you know, would, would, would veto any action against Russia. Um, but it's also clear that China would do the same. Um, and uh, to the extent that the United Nations could refer, Security Council could refer cases, war crimes cases, to the International Court of Criminal Justice, uh, they're not doing that. Uh, even though it seems obvious, um, and uh, there's been, you know, a, a fair amount of, you know, revelation about the United Nations and how it's a failed organization. Um, is it in China's best interest to do that? Uh, they they seem to be standing up with Putin in the same place on all the United Nations decisions where they're vetoing or threatening threatening to veto and and stopping any United Nations process. Does that really work in their favor? I, I I think what China has done is they've abstained at at the Security Council because they because they have Russia they, they know that Russia is going to object and so they they can basically abstain which of course is what you know what uh, a lot of countries did you know in the context of the General Assembly that you know the the countries that aren't part of the Security Council abstain and and you know in the case of, of China they they didn't they didn't vote with Russia they they you know as you know they 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 abstained. In the Security Council vote, uh, so you know, so I, again, you know, they're they're trying to play that that game that that says, hey, we we, you know, we're not we believe in non-interference, and you know, yes, we agree that that uh, sovereignty is is important, and that we we respect the UN processes, uh, without you know, without making any commitments beyond uh, what's interest what's what's in the interest of China, which is to to avoid making a commitment on this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they say that this this war in Ukraine and you know all the uh, events around it um, are changing the global world order, the liberal world order, anyway. Um, and I guess one of the decisions that China would have made is uh, that's okay with us. We like to we like to see it changed. We don't really care to have a liberal world order. Um, oh. and we, we like it to be the way you know it serves our purposes. I, I hear you disagreeing, Carl. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to disagree. I think you know I think China does benefit from the liberal order, and and then that's why they that's why they they don't try to push too hard in supporting Russia. You know that's the other side of the China story. Is they're not they're they're being very careful to avoid being criticized or or accused by the United States of of evading of helping Russia evade sanctions. You know, the only thing they're doing is they're saying, well, we we aren't stopping commerce, but they aren't they aren't supporting sanctions. Again, it's it's everything everything that China's doing is is in the negative. It's non-support. It's not it's not that they're actively supporting either side. It's it always runs back to non-support. So so no, they 
China, China is the is the biggest beneficiary of the international liberal order out there. And so they're not they're not going to say, no, we want to change the order. What they, as you know, what they want, and that's why they keep harping on this, what they want is they want to be able to have more influence on the international order. They want to be able to maintain their state-owned enterprises. They want to maintain their supply chain integrity, just like we do. They want to be able to act with impunity, just like we do. You know, so so they're not they're not suggesting that that they want to overturn the international order. They simply want to be able to say we want more control over the international order because we believe that the United States, by imposing unilateral sanctions, is is trying to disrupt that role. So that's I think that's how you how I would characterize it. I wouldn't say they they want to overturn the international order. They want to use it to their advantage, just mm -hmm. like I mean they want to be just like us. You know, they want to be just like Russia. And, and so I think that's a more accurate description of, of what China is trying to accomplish here. And, and I mean, how, we, how, how do we stop that? I think you, you, you have to think about how, how you characterize what's happening. And, and, and when, we, when we point out to the, to the Chinese that, you no, know, the, the international liberal order is at risk because people are violating the law, the, the international norm of sovereignty and, and using military force, then we force them into a position of having to, having to justify how they are not condemning Russia's action. Mm -hmm. So it's a dialogue. And, and on that, uh, my, the, my last area of inquiry with you today, Carl, is uh, in all of this, um, you know, given COVID and the problems they've had with COVID, given the economy problems they've had, and maybe the you know, confidence of the people problems, and given their, you know, the, the path they have chosen in dealing with Ukraine and the Western coalition, in all of that, how, how is their relationship with the United States doing? And how is our relationship with them doing? Certainly these, these things offer the possibility that that relationship has changed or is changing or will change. What do you think? Yeah, I, well, that's that's a good that's a it's a good area to think about because uh, you know as as I was thinking about the show, you know, it occurs to me that what's what's happened, I think, is is China has come to the realization that the United States is going to be a competitor, that that the the choice the United and, and again they'll they'll put it on us. They're going to say the United States has made the choice to compete with China. And since we know that, since we Chinese now know that the United States is going to want to compete, we have to protect our interests. And, and the way we protect our interests is, is we, we, you know, we, we solidify our own supply chains. You know, we, we do what, what the Chinese call dual circulation, where they build their own consumer base and they make sure that they have technological advantages uh, in, in, in certain areas, they become less dependent on the United States for the financial system. You know, in other words, moving away from, from SWIFT, moving away from buying treasury bonds, and, and they, they have a, a better sense, a, a better control over the technology that they produce and the, their reliance on Western technology. So of course, they're, they're pushing their semiconductor industries and, and you know, the whole, the whole uh, you know, technology 2025 push that, that Xi Jinping has introduced, you know, to, to develop uh, high tech in industries like, like electric vehicles, uh, uh, surveillance equipment and all that stuff. You know, they're, they're, they're looking at, at pursuing those areas because they see uh, ultimately this is going to become a technological battle between the United States and, and China. And they're probably right. Uh... What about the the, uh, the rhetoric? Has the rhetoric changed? Will it change? Uh, what is Joe Biden, Biden saying about them that you know maybe different than a year ago? What are they saying about the U.S. maybe different than a year ago? Is there any tension? Is what I'm asking. Yeah, there's there's tension because because there's competition and you know and I think what what you know we're we're, we're I think both sides are falling into this into this binariness a little bit. Where, where it's either us or China. So the United States is, is pushing hard to get commitments out of, out of the rest of Asia on, on uh, supporting the United States versus China. This whole Indo-Pacific economic framework that's coming out here in the next, in the next while is going to be a big challenge because the, the, the United States is pushing it and it's, and it's very much looks to the rest of the world like a China containment policy. 
and and China is going to push that narrative. I think that that uh, you guys need to be careful what you're doing with the United States because you're they're they're making you choose between China and the United States. And what we want is inclusivity. We can and we can show you that through the you know through the regional comprehensive economic partnership. You can see that we're trying to become part of the comprehensive and progressive uh, tra uh, trans-Pacific partnership. You know, all those economic uh, agreements that China is trying to get on while the United States is trying to push its own framework is, is going to become, I think, the next area of competition beyond just the natural, uh, you know, competition between the countries in Asia uh, and, and uh, the competition in South China Sea over over territorial uh, claims and all that. So yeah, I think the rhetoric has changed and, and it's, 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 it's reifying itself into very, very stern terms of, of us or them kinds of, uh, kinds of uh, choices. So what's your advice to Joe Biden? Well, my advice to Joe Biden is to really think hard about what he wants in terms of economic engagement in Asia. And I, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of a vain, vain request at this point, but uh, you know, you really need to think about how much benefit there is to, to joining the comprehensive and progressive uh, uh, Trans-Pacific trans Partnership. I mean, after the fact, you know, after we walked away from it, it's almost impossible to believe that we could get back to that. But this, this new economic framework is, is, not gonna, is not gonna do that. It's going, to, it's going to create an even hardened line between US and China and force, force the Asian countries into, into having to figure out how to deal with that. And then, you know, I, I mean, I, I just think that, that we, we are short-sighted. I, I would say to, to President Biden that the Americans are being short-sighted by thinking that we can get away without trying to figure out where areas we can cooperate in. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that seems to be lost. You know, John Kerry has kind of thrown his flame out there and it doesn't seem to be burning very bright these days about the... Uh, you know, cooperating on climate change, uh, there, there seems to be a, a divergence between what, what China thinks is doable and what the United States thinks is doable. And, and certainly there's, there's, no, there's no talk about, uh, you know, other areas of, of uh, cooperation in terms of nonproliferation or anything like that. Yeah, that would be better to find points of cooperation. But what, you know, what, what you portray here is um, we are in a time of, of uh, change uh, with with major events happening around the world, uh, that that each one of them has the possibility of changing the world, um, and thus uh, our relationship with China is likely to change somehow going going forward, and and that means Carl will have to keep on watching it, don't you think? I mean, in the aggregate, it's it's clear that that there's there's change there's change coming, and you know, and it's just a question of how big the change is and how 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 well we can manage the change. You know, it's not it's not going to be a, a light switch that goes off, or at least I hope it's not going to be a light switch that goes off. But, uh, you know, if, if, if the, I mean, I think the best case scenario is that we, we see the change, we manage the change and, and we accept that that China is going to play a bigger role and it's going to play a role, a bigger role independent of its relationship with the United States, that it's it's looking at how it can influence the rest of the world. And, and that's what we need to really think about how we manage. How do we manage the narrative that goes along with, with China gaining more and more influence in, in the rest of the world? Not just, not just the, in the US-China relationship anymore, but in the rest of the world. And, and that has to be managed and it has to be managed intelligently, not, not us or them kind of mentality, but how can we, how can we share responsibility for things? That's, that's I think, the, the big challenge. Mm, Mark Wood and all of that. Uh, Carl Baker, Senior Advisor, Pacific Forum. Thank you so much for coming around and contributing to our shows, Carl. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha.